Now it's time to turn our attention to the word of our God. And if you have a copy of the scriptures, I'd like to invite you to open with me, first of all, to Job chapter 19. I'm going to touch on a few verses here in the book of Job. We've been studying together in the book of Job. We've been looking at Job's sufferings and how Job's story forces us to deal with some of the deep issues and big questions of life, like how can an all-powerful God allow so much suffering in the world if he is good? And, and can God really be just if he allows so much injustice in the world? Have you ever questioned God in this way? Maybe you've never really thought about it or you just you don't ever want to question God. Um, but have you ever wondered how God could be just if he allowed things like the Jewish Holocaust? Or uh, right here in the United States, every day over 1,700 babies are aborted in their mother's womb. Could God really be just if he allowed Job to suffer in the way that he did for the reasons that he did? I, those are not necessarily easy questions, but maybe there have even for you personally, maybe there have been moments in your life, things that have happened to you that cause you to question the justice of God or maybe even if God really exists. You know, initially, Job responded really well to his circumstances, right? Right in chapters one and two, he responded with faith towards God and worship. But over time, as his pain and suffering wore on him, you begin to see Job become bitter against God. And eventually, Job accused God of treating him unjustly and abusing him. Job, in essence, wanted to become the prosecutor and summon God to court and put God on trial for the things that God allowed in his life. So, Job chapter 19 Verses six through seven. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Job chapter 19, Job 23, then Job 27. I'm just gonna catch a few verses for us to, to get going here. Job chap, chapter 19, verse six. Know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. Job 23, verse one. Then Job answered and said, today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, God, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. There, an upright man could argue with him, and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. Then lastly, Job chapter 27, verse two. I'm gonna read from the NIV in this passage which says, as surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made my life bitter. I wanna now go to the Lord in prayer and ask him as we open God's word together. Father, we give you thanks for this day and your blessings, and we thank you now for your word. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness both to your own self and to us, your children. And Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to your word. And now, Father, I pray that you'd be faithful to speak to us as your children and to feed us. Help me to be faithful to your word. 
And I pray that you would open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things out of your law here in this place. Father, I pray that you do good things among your people today. In Christ's name, amen. This is what I want to do today. I want to look at the justice of God. And, and I want to ask a very relevant question. Is it ever okay for us to question God? I mean, I know we do it, but is it okay? And what I want to do, I want to look at this from two aspects. I, I first want to look at this from an intellectual perspective, and then I want to look at it from an emotional perspective, okay? So number one, from an intellectual perspective, okay, and listen, I know the things I'm about to talk to you about are, are not easy, and so for, for a few minutes, I want us to check our emotional baggage with the conductor, and we're going to come back to it, okay? I'm not going to leave it undressed, but, but I want us to think about what the, these things from an intellectual and biblical perspective, okay? From an intellectual perspective, do we have the right to question God? Remember, he is the creator and we are the creatures, we are the created beings. I really do find this interesting, and I'm no doubt you've heard other people do this, and maybe you've even said something like it, but sometimes people will refuse to believe in God unless God lives up to all the standards that they have for him. You know, it's kind of like a two-year-old denying believing in their parents unless their parents give them the flavor of ice cream that they want, right? It's like, I just wanna say, that's not the way it works. God doesn't exist if you approve of who he is and what he does. You know, it's like, you're the creature. You, you can't, he created us. We don't get to determine the, um, you know, the nature or character or ways of God. I, is it appropriate for us to question God? Um, I want to look at this from an Old I want to look at two passages, an Old Testament and a New Testament passage, okay? Uh, the book of Daniel chronicles part of the reign of a wicked king named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah in 597 B.C. That's approximately 600 years before Jesus was born. He destroyed Jerusalem. He tore down the temple he carried as hostages or captives many of the Jewish people as exiles back to Babylon. The Bible argues that Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was a wicked king, he was a king that God raised up as an act of judgment against his people for their sins. That's what the Bible says. Look at Habakkuk. Um, even, even the prophet Habakkuk struggled with how a righteous God could allow, allow a king even more wicked than the Israelites to come and do what he did. Uh, a prophet struggled with this question too. So, I mean, I think we have good grounds to wrestle with it ourselves. In Daniel chapter four, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream that even though he was the greatest king in the earth at that time, most likely, God was going to chop him down like a tree and make him go live like an animal outdoors. So Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel, and he wants Daniel to give him the interpretation of the dream. And here's what Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4, verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King that you shall be driven among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And guess what happened? The dream came true. Just like God and Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind and went to, he left his palace and lived outdoors. 
Uh, under the dew, it says that his hair grew long and wild, and uh, we're told that even his fingernails and toenails grew long, almost like animal claws. And after seven periods of time, which could have been seven months, maybe seven years, not 100% sure, but after seven periods of time, God restored Nebuchadnezzar's sanity to him. Not only that, he restored the throne to him as well. I want you to listen to what this evil king said after God, you see, God essentially put him in school. I'm gonna teach you that it's the most high that rules in the kingdom of men. Listen to what uh, Nebuchadnezzar said. This is Daniel 4, 34 and 35. At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion. (laughs) Before Nebuchadnezzar's like all about my dominion, my kingdom, my great image. Now he's like, I have been introduced to the true sovereign. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Listen carefully to verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand. That means you can't stop what he's doing. Or say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar says, you better watch out if you want to question God in a sinful way. I want to give you a New Testament example. And guys, uh, Romans chapter 9, one of the most difficult passages in all of the Bible. But Paul approaches this question about God's justice head on. Um, Romans chapter nine is, um, explains God's sovereignty in choosing to save, save some, but not others. And Paul knows that people are gonna struggle with that. So this is what Paul does. He says what he's gonna say, but he knows the objections that people are gonna feel when they hear this. So he interacts with the objections, you know, that he foresees coming up. So just, just listen to this. Romans nine, I'm gonna read verses 11 through 21. And he's, he's, again, he's talking about, listen, why, why, why do some Jews believe the gospel and others don't? And he applies this to the Gentiles at the end of the passage. So he's, gonna, he's given the example of um, Jacob and Esau. Romans 9, 11, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, Jacob and Esau's mother, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Listen to this question. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says, God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, here's another objection. You will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? I mean, if God hardens some and he gives mercy to others, who's really resisting his will? Now listen to this, verse 20. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God. Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter 
no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. Who are we to answer back to God? We think we're the potter. We want God to be the clay and we will mold things the way we want. But he says, no, God's the potter. And we technically, from an intellectual standpoint, do not have a right or we don't have the position or authority to question God or his ways. One more step from an intellectual standpoint. And I realize what I'm about to say is, I just wanna be honest, from an emotional perspective is, is I struggle with this, okay? So I don't wanna pretend like, I'm going to tell y'all how it is and just suck it up, buttercup, you know. I, emotionally, these things are hard to grapple with. I, they are. But, but uh, listen to this. Do you realize, thinking about suffering and injustice, do you realize that any suffering, less than eternal suffering, is less than you and I deserve? Any suffering that we experience that's less than eternal suffering is less suffering than we deserve. Now, Matt, why do you believe that? Well, you probably believe it too, but let's just see. Do you believe that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Do you believe what the scriptures teach? That eternal separation from Christ is the due penalty for our sins. If you follow these first two biblical principles, then you have to admit that we all deserve eternal punishment. Do you also realize just in case someone here is thinking, I don't like this. I don't like the way he's taking this. Do you realize without this principle, there is absolutely no good news? Sometimes as a parent, you know, you, your children might say to you, that's not fair. Well, it could be that you as a parent aren't being fair, and if you're not, you need to stop and you need to be a godly parent. But a lot of times our kids just say that because they, they just don't like what we're doing. They don't like what's right. And so, you know, that's a good time to teach your children to say, you want what's fair? You want God to give you what's fair? It's sort of a play on words, but is that what you want, right? Teach them to understand Mercy, and, and you know, this is what, hey, when, you start thinking, when you start thinking about these things, like some of you are gonna go home and really, you're gonna talk about lunch, like, I can't believe Matt said that. But think, of, start putting all this together. Because so many people fail to believe what the Bible says about our sinfulness and what we deserve. This is the reason by, why so few people, even many people who call themselves Christians, do not live authentic lives of gratitude. So my point is this, if we all deserve eternal suffering and any suffering less than that is less than we deserve, then we cannot biblically or intellectually charge God with injustice for allowing suffering. In fact, let's keep teasing this out a little bit more, one more implication. Any soul to whom God has given life to, any moment lived without suffering is a gift, is a, is a moment of mercy from God. Now, that's the intellect, intellectual perspective. Let's look now, number two, from an emotional perspective. Y'all, I'm, I'm thankful for the intellectual angle. 
I want to have complete faith in all that the Bible teaches. Uh, it, this biblical, there would be no gospel out, uh, without it, but y'all know what? Aren't you thankful that God doesn't deal with us on a purely intellectual level? I ought to be getting an amen. <laughs> Maybe I didn't say the first point right. <laughs> Aren't you glad God doesn't just deal with this like on a, a cold, unemotional, here's the facts level? The good news is that God deals tenderly with his people as his dear children. God understands that sometimes we have questions, that we struggle to understand his ways. Um, even before we were born, God knew that sometimes we would have doubts. You know, interestingly, I seem to have, and sometimes, um, you know, I was very zealous as a teenager and a young Christian man, and I, I never doubted anything about God. Rah, give it to me. Amen. The Bible says that that settles it. I believe it. Done. You know, but if you're a thinking person and you engage with things you experience and things of the world, sometimes we have doubts, right? Even before we were born, God knew that we would have questions, doubts, and fears, and that sometimes, even like Job, we might sinfully question God in our hearts. But you know what God didn't do? Even though God did, we're gonna see this next week, even though God did take Job to the woodshed, God didn't crush Job. Psalm 103, listen to this. Beginning in verse eight. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. <laughs> listen to this, verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God knows our limitations. He knows our sin. He knows our struggle. And he, he loved us taking into account all of those things. Isn't that good news? Although he would be just if he did, he doesn't deal with us according to our sins. Instead, he deals with us with a heart full of steadfast love, this love that's higher, as high above the earth as the heavens are, right? It, it, with an immeasurable amount of love, God loves us. Why does God not deal with us after our sins? Did you know that there was another man in the Bible that questioned God? Do you remember Jesus on the night before he was crucified there in the garden of Gethsemane? How over and over again he cried out to God that if it be possible, the cup that he was facing, he would not have to drink it. What was the cup? You see, when Jesus went to the cross, he would drink from the cup of God's wrath that was poured out on the sin of every single one of God's people. But here's what I want you to see. When Jesus questioned God, even when he didn't get an answer, even when the answer wasn't the one Jesus was asking, do you know what Jesus said? 
and we gotta say this too, y'all. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, he submitted himself to the will of the Father. And the next day, um, as he was scourged, beaten, crown of thorns pressed into his head, stripped, stripped naked, hands and feet nailed to those wooden beams. He questions God again, screaming out in agony. Don't believe those ridiculous pictures of a white Jesus laying there peacefully on a cross like, mm -hmm. this was brutal, it was agony. Crying out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was Jesus there that day? Why was he the one screaming out in agony, questioning God? Do you realize, my friends, that Jesus is the true and better Job? He's the truly, ultimately, perfectly innocent sufferer who willingly allowed himself to suffer injustice at the hands of sinners, all for what? A few moments ago, I was trying to make the case that you and I deserve eternal suffering. At the cross, the king of the universe humbled himself and willingly took the place of his people. And he absorbed and quenched the punishment, the suffering that we deserved. All that so that instead of you and I experiencing justice, you wanna ask for what's fair, Jesus got what was fair for us. So if you're here today and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, all you get from God is his mercy and grace. You've got, to, you will never understand the gospel, you will never understand the grace, understand grace, until you understand that it should have been you there on that cross. Should have been me. When you look at any suffering in the world, whether you have gone through something a nightmare, unbelievable, or if it's suffering on a large scale, someplace far away, another country. You look at any suffering in the world, um, you might be tempted to think, oh, how could God allow this? But when you, you gotta look at the whole picture, you see. It's when we interpret suffering and, and the circumstances we see in the world, when we interpret it through the Bible's teaching on sin, and when we interpret it through the life and the death of Christ, it is impossible to charge God with injustice. How could God be unjust if he's willing himself to suffer injustice in order to redeem us and restore us and renew all of creation? So let's close with this question that we started with. Is it ever okay to question God? Is it okay to doubt? My answer as a pastor is it depends on how you do it. You can do it like Job or you can do it like Jesus. Job became arrogant. You know, I didn't have time to read all of this, but when you, you get to the end of Job's speeches, Job 30 and 31, Job's bitter against God, and he's like, God, has, God is perverting injustice. And you know what Job does? He parades all of his goodness and his righteousness out before God. These are all the reasons why I should never suffer. You see, it wasn't just Job's friends. I think Job had a little bit of the prosperity gospel also. And God had to teach him. 
when question, and they will. If you're a thinking person, they will. Unless you disengage your mind, you're gonna have doubts, you're gonna have questions. You may not get all of your questions answered in this lifetime, but you know, you can come to God arrogantly, like God, if you don't do it my way, then I just won't, I won't worship you if that's the way you're gonna do things. I won't believe in you. Or when those questions arise in your heart, can take them to your loving heavenly father like Jesus did with humility, with respect, and, and an attitude of submission. Lord, <laughs> Lord, I don't understand how this could be happening. Why, why, Lord, why? Your why will never be as big as Jesus is on the cross, ever. It, like, it, it, bad as it can be, it won't come close as his why but he did it with submission and resignation to the will of the Father. Simply put, when we struggle with doubts and questions, we need to follow the example of Jesus. And I'll close with this. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 and following. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, if you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Verse 22, he committed no sin neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When you suffer, or when those nagging doubts, questions creep up in your mind and heart. Follow the example of Jesus and not Job. Father, we thank you for your word. And we do thank you, Lord. You, you never did say, you never did tell us to perfectly understand everything you were doing or all your plans or how everything makes sense, that you have commanded us to trust you. And over and over and over again, in your word, in the scriptures, and in our own lives of your, as your children, you have proved yourself faithful over and over again. And so we praise you. Father, do forgive us of the times Lord, because no doubt there are times, I, I know for myself, Lord, and, and probably for most of us, there may have been times in our lives where we did, in our pride, question you or disbelief. Father, I pray that when you call us to walk through deep waters or through the fiery furnace, that you would be with us and that you would help us to remember the faithful promises of your word. We love you. Bless your word now to us in the name of Jesus. Amen.